And let me pray for us. God, we are so thankful to be in your house today and worship you. Let us put the focus where it belongs, on your scriptures and the truth that is in it. May it point us to your son and the cross, Jesus Christ. May we relish in the fact that uh, you are a God of, of mercy that we cannot even comprehend and grace that we don't even know, can never fathom. May we never get over what you have done for us in sending your son to pay a price that we could not even pay to give us a life we did not deserve. Let us worship under that banner of truth here this morning and every day of our lives. We pray all this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you for coming today. I'm glad you are here. As always, it's uh, my privilege to break open God's word with you. Numbers 27. I don't even want to venture a guess last time you heard a sermon from the book of Numbers because let's be honest, it's a bit of a slog to get through. It is a book of numbers, dimensions and idea uh, and, and censuses and all these different things that, that you have to try to comprehend. And the goal of every passage of scripture is how does this piece of literature, how does this portion point us to Jesus and what he did? And when you start talking about dimensions and things of that nature, it, it gets a little it's a little difficult, to be honest with you, and, and trying to navigate that. And uh, Leviticus is not much better. It's just a little bit different as far as what do all these things tell us about Jesus Christ. But it's broken up with these stories and these examples of uh, these laws coming into play here. And Numbers 27 is exactly that. If you are just joining us here today for the first time or have been here in a few weeks, we are in the middle of a series about misunderstood women of the Bible. We've looked at two so far. We looked at Hagar last week and how she was the first person to actually lay eyes on Jesus at the well there when she was trying to get away from the followers of God because the followers of God were mistreating her so poorly. Uh, so she ran away and Jesus encountered her at the well there. And we saw that Hagar, the Egyptian polytheistic slave who was carrying a child by illegitimate means, had more faith in Yahweh and the God that you and I worship than Abram and Sarah that she would, that he would indeed fulfill the promises that uh, that he said that he would. The week before that, we looked at Vashti and the example, and, and how she's a picture of Jesus. She was punished unjustly for the things that occurred, for the things that happened to her. Uh, the king asked uh, an insane request, an errant request, a wrong request of her. She stood up for herself and said, "No, I'm not doing that," and was punished because of that, when she did not deserve to be punished. And how Jesus paid the price for you and me when we should have paid that price, even though we couldn't. We should have been sent to hell, but yet, but we see Jesus stepping into the scene here and changing our story forever and the story of, of uh, everyone else in Scripture. Today is not maybe misunderstood as much as uh, we just don't talk about the book of Numbers. We don't talk about the book of Levit the Leviticus for somewhat good reasons because it is difficult. And today's story and these women are these daughters that we will affectionately call the sisters because I really don't want to try to say these five names every single time we get to them in uh, in the story here what's going on there's two things that i want to communicate to you that point us to jesus christ about what's going on in numbers 27 the first thing that i want you to see here is that these ladies these sisters had no legal claim to the land the justice system of the day the legal system of the day the cultural dynamics were of such difference to us that we don't really understand what's happening here all the time when the father would pass away, it would go to the eldest son. And the problem is, in this case, that there is no eldest son, that there, is no, there are no sons at all. And so we see these five sisters gather together in verse 1 of 27, or in verse, uh, in verse 2 of 27, I'm sorry. And they stood before Moses, the high priest, uh, Elihazar, or Hazar, however you want to say, which, by the way, is Aaron's oldest son, who is now the, the priest, and the leaders, probably the leaders of the tribe, and it says the entire community. Now, you and I, if you've read the entire Bible, you have read Numbers 27, but you probably couldn't pick it out out of a stack of stories of ones that have made a monumental impact on your life because of what it is. But when we see that Moses, the high priest, the leaders, and the entire community gathered together for what was about to transpire, that should really be indicative of how big of a deal this was at this time. All of these people are gathering together. The entire community is waiting to see how this case is going to play out, how this trial is going to play out. So while it may not seem important to us now, and we may not be able to pick it out out of a list of stories, 
was monumentally important at that point in history. And so they go before Moses, and the way that the judicial system worked at this point was Moses presided over a bunch of cases to begin with, set precedents moving forward so that other people could uh, judge these cases, and Moses would only hear the most complex, difficult, and new cases that had never been developed before, and this is exactly what we have here with these sisters going to Moses. So we see Moses and that they're gathered at the tent of meeting. Can you imagine the courage, just the, the insane amount of courage to even bring this to Moses, much less bring this to Moses and the high priests, Moses the high priest and the tribe leaders, Moses the high priest and the tribe leaders, and while you're doing all of this, the entire community is watching you. Can you imagine the amount of pressure that this would have been for anybody, much less a woman in this culture, which was generally looked down upon, so they stood before Moses and this priest, and they are pleading with the people for the land that belonged to their father. When we see what happens here is they, they, they explain to Moses and all of these other people that are there, our father died in the wilderness. They want to make something clear. They're not trying to prove the innocence of their father. No, that's not what's happening. They're actually saying that the fact that their father died in the wilderness means that he was guilty of something, and we'll get to that. But they want to make it clear that it wasn't this incident with Korah. And if you want to read about that, you can flip back to chapter 16 in Numbers to read about what happened in that incident. But for the sake of time, we're, we're not going to get into it. But in the wilderness, if you recall what happened, Moses led the people out of Egypt through the miraculous events of plagues. And he takes them, and he's leading them to this place called the Promised Land, right? He takes us to the promised land or on the outskirts of the promised land. They make camp and they are about to go into the promised land or about to decide if they're going to go into the promised land. They, they get these 12 spies together. They send them into the promised land, which is currently inhabited by other people. And they sent these spies to figure out, you know, ask a list of questions as far as what's the city like? Is there, you know, are they fortified? Is there a lot of technology? Like, are they going to be able to fight us off or how, how's this going to work? And so these spies come back and they report and, Ten of them say, uh, yeah, we probably shouldn't do this. We, we, we probably shouldn't go into this land. It's, it's, too, it, it's too fortified. The people are too strong. The technology is too advanced. We, we, would, uh, we would definitely lose that fight. Two of them said we should do this, not because their technology was better, not because they were stronger, they had more people or anything like that, but they said the reason that we can do this has nothing to do with any of those things, but because God said so. Because God said the victory was at hand, that he would deliver us. God was bigger than the fortresses. He was better than the technology. He was smarter than the best military strategists. And if the people followed God, they could have had the promised land. And the people said, nah, we don't have enough confidence in God. We don't have enough faith in God. We don't think that we can do this. And so God says, because of your lack of faith and your lack of confidence, now you have to wander around in the wilderness. And this... Zohalafed, however you want to say it, now has to wander in the wilderness because of that, which is a big deal. But in another sense, all that means is that the next generation was going to get to go into the promised land and not the current generation. And for those with sons, it was not the end of the world. It was a harsh judgment. It was a bad judgment. But at the end of the day, at least their sons would be able to experience the promised land, except for this one. And the reason is because, again, I had no sons. And so this land was going to be occupied, bought, sold. I don't know how, what was going to happen to it. But it was not going to go to the daughters the way that it was currently set up in the judicial system. So Moses hears this case in front of everybody. And they're trying to make the point. And they understand here, listen, we know that this land is not ours right now. We know that we can't possess this. We can't just walk up to it and lay claim to it. It's not us that can do that. So they go through the proper channels and they understand and they... They, they try to get God on their side, try to, under, try to get God to, to give them the land back. And it comes to Moses to make that decision. Their father sinned, but they should have had the land, or they, they wanted the land anyway, since they had no sons. So Moses is faced with a pretty big decision here after the women of extreme courage and boldness go before him. And I want to point out that you and I, need to realize what these sisters realize is that we don't have anything in this world. You and I lay no claim to anything in this world. We are like these sisters, and it is time that you and I understand that we have no right to anything in this world. You do not own anything 
in this world. I understand that you might work a job that pays you money and you have to work really hard at that job and you get paid because of that and you use that money to buy things, to buy boats and cars and houses and all these things. But how did you get the job? You got the job because of connections, because of skills. Well, who gave you the connections? Who gave you the skills? God did. You boil it all down to God's the one that got you the job. God's the one that got you the paycheck. God's the one that got you the money to be able to buy all these things. All of these things belong to God. And what the sisters realized is that land didn't belong to them. It belonged to God. And it was up to God to decide what was going to happen with that land. And you and I need to understand that our stuff that we own, that we purchase, is not actually ours. And it's not just our stuff. And it's not just our careers that belong to God. Everything belongs to Him. Our children belong to God. The Bible is perfectly clear that children are a gift from who? God. They're not ours. They're not ours. And some days, praise God, my child is not mine, right? Like, that's a, that's a good thing. Every time she does something bad, no, I'm just kidding. She never does anything bad. He's always, per no, I wish that were the case, right? Our children are not ours. God entrusts us with the children, with children, but they're not ours to begin with. He's the one that gives them to us. There's this mentality of it's my church to do with what I want to. And I get it to an extent, like I get like you say it's my church and you're saying that you belong to a body of believers and that's, that's probably okay. But whenever we do things like, well, my church needs a pastor, my church needs a choir, my church needs a pastor who will wear a tie, my church needs a pastor that will preach out of the King James Bible, my church needs this, my church needs modern music, my church needs traditional music. And let me just tell you, as I've told you probably many times before, it is not your church or my church to make a decision for. It is God's church and all you and I are supposed to do to try to figure out the decision that has already been made. It's not my church and it's not your church. It's his. They aren't my ministries. They aren't your ministries. They are God's ministries. They aren't your kids. They are God's kids. They aren't. It isn't your money. It's God's money. Everything you have in this world belongs solely to God. You are just entrusted with it. And these women understood this land was not theirs. They had no claim to it. They inquired of God and of Moses how to obtain the land, as they should have, as they went through the process to do so. And we need to inquire of God, God, what do we do when my kids won't listen to me? What do we do when our career is on the line and we have to choose between integrity and keeping our job? What do we do when tough situations come into the church and we have to make some form of decision? What do, what do we do? And, and what do we do? We go to the tent of meeting and we inquire of the Lord, God, what would you have me to do in this situation with your stuff, with your things, with your money, with your church, with your children, what would you have me to do in this moment with you? Paul makes it clear in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10, the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed. Even the one that plants things, they don't have food because they had to get the seeds from somewhere and those seeds were of God. I hope I've driven home the point that you own nothing in this world. Let me say that one more time. You own nothing in this world that belongs to you. But more importantly, I want you to understand that while you lay no claim to anything in this life, you also lay no claim to anything in the next life either. You think God needs you? You think God needs you in eternity? No, he doesn't need you in eternity. You lay no claim to your relationship with him. You offer nothing to that relationship except the sin that made it necessary for a restoration to begin with. God doesn't need you. He is completely self-sufficient from you. You lay no claim to a relationship with him. One of the most depressing verses and section of scripture, I think in all of the Bible is Ephesians 2 verse 1. Paul writes, and you were dead dead, non-existent, lifeless. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. You chose sin instead of God, which makes you dead. In which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. 
We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires. We're not immune to this death. We've all experienced it. Carrying out the inclinations and the desires of our flesh and the thoughts that we have. And we, we, you and I and everybody else in the world were by nature children under the wrath of our creator as the others were also. You are dead. What does this world give you? Death. What do you have in this world? Death. What do you have in this world? Nothing. Nothing at all in this world belongs to you. It at all belongs to the creator of the universe. The things that you think you own, you don't actually own. And we should treat it as such because it is God who is in control of everything. And it is time that we honor God with the things and the ministries and the church that he has so richly blessed us with. Which leads me to the second point with these women. They go before Moses and the priests and we want the land, but we got to go through the proper channels. And what God does is incredible. God decides to give them the land anyway. They knew that they had no legal standing currently in the way that the system was set up to have the land. So after hearing what the sisters said, Moses took the words to God. Let me pause and time out here. Any spiritual leader that you ever encounter in your entire life that claims to have all of the answers to life's questions, to scripture, to God, um, run the other direction from that person, okay? Because they are essentially saying that they are of the same intellect and intelligence of God. There is no one that has all the answers to life questions. Even one of the greatest spiritual leaders in all of the world, known as Moses, what did he do? When he had a question about what to do, he inquired of God and said, God, what do I do? This was a tough situation for Moses trying to decide what it is. And what God said back to Moses would have been so countercultural, so revolutionary, so earth shattering for the original audience. God said, the sisters are correct. Give them the land. Give them the land that they had no claim to. Give them the land that they had no legal standing to get, that if everything would have continued to play on, that they would have never seen. God said, give them the land. And not just to give them the land, but God tells Moses to, to make sure that you communicate to the people the statutes moving forward. Well, if this happens and this happens, in other words, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing for you. You can read that on your own. The point I think we need to understand from that is God makes provisions for provisions for provisions for provisions. What, say that five times fast, right? Say, and God makes all of these things happen to make sure everything is thought of and taken care of before it ever happens again. From the beginning of time, that's how God's operated. In the garden, he knew that this was going to need a plan to save humanity. From the very beginning, this was God's plan to sacrifice his own son on the cross. These sisters who had no claims to the land decided to go before Moses and the people boldly in hopes that they could change the situation, that they could have the land, and God entrusted these sisters with the land. They had no legal standing at that point in history, and God gave it to them anyway. All the things you do have in this world come from God himself. And why has he given you those things? Why has he given you a career? Why has he given you children? Why has he given you stuff? Why has he given you a church to worship in? Why has he given you all those things? Let me tell you why he hasn't. It's not because you earned it. It's certainly not because you deserve it. The reason he has given you all those things is to show you his mercy and his grace and his love to you. You did nothing to get the things that you have in this life. You did nothing to deserve the life that you have today. We do not deserve to gather together and worship, and yet we take times like this for granted. Things that we specifically carve out for God, and we say, no, other things are more important than that. We'll we can't even sacrifice two hours of sleep in order to worship God on Sunday morning. God looks at us. He sees all that sin. He sees all that muck. He sees all that mire. And he says, you know what? Even though you forsake me, even though you care more for sleep, even though you care more for your job, even though you care more for this and that and everything else, you care more for everything else in this world except for me, God looks at you and says, I love you. I'm going to show you my mercy and I'm going to show you my grace. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. 
He sees we have no standing. God knows that. God knows we have no leg to stand on in this relationship, and he still wants it anyway. He doesn't just do that with the things of this world, with your career and jobs and kids and life. This is the gospel message presented to us in the book of Numbers. We have no claim to a relationship with God. We should not have a relationship with God. But yet God wants one anyway. These women left it up to God and Moses to make a decision. I don't know what the women would have done if God would have said, no, you can't have it. But that's not what happened. So we don't have to theorize there. And we don't have to theorize what the world would be like if he hadn't chosen to sacrifice his son. Because that's the reality. That's where you and I live. We leave our salvation and our life up to God. And God says, I will bless you. Even when you do not deserve it. What God was giving to these women was not just a piece of land for them at that point, at that time. He was teaching all of God's people then and all of God's people now the lesson that I will give you what you don't deserve. Which is a relationship with me. Which is more precious than any land, thing, person. A relationship with God is the greatest gift that we can ever have. Max Lucado was saying, credited with saying, and you probably heard it before, if our greatest need had been for, an, uh, for intelligence, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been the, uh, technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been for money, God would have sent us an economist. But our greatest need was not for any of those things. Our greatest need was for forgiveness and mercy. And so he sent us the Savior. He looks at you, and even though you don't deserve eternal life, he wants to offer it to you anyway. And that's why one of the most depressing passages in all of Scripture, Ephesians 2, while it starts depressing, changes drastically in verse 4. You are dead. According to Paul in Ephesians 2, you are dead because of your sin and you are lifeless. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. Uh, as the saying goes, um, you are up the creek without a paddle. And not only did you not have a paddle, you don't have a boat. Not only do you not have a boat, you don't know how to swim. And uh, you, are you are drowning constantly. And God looks at you in verse 4 and he says, but God, you were dead you are lifeless. But God, in verse 4, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, not because you earned it, not because you deserved it, but because he is rich in mercy, he is rich in love. You know what he did? He took our lifeless souls and our lifeless bodies and made us alive, it says in verse 5. With Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace because God wanted you that way. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavens in Christ Jesus. Not only did he just save us from our lifeless, dead bodies and souls, he rewards us and gives us riches untold so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace. Through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. You have no claim to the land. You have nothing to offer this relationship. The only reason you have a relationship from God. Because Paul it says it is a gift from him. Not from works that no man can boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. What's going on? Numbers 27 verses 1 through 11. It's a real life, real world example of the gospel message that we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to invite Addie to come up and play as we enter into a time of invitation. If you're here today and you understand that, that you have no standing before God, you offer nothing to that relationship except for the sin that made it necessary, and you want to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to be down front. I want to encourage you to, to come down front. I want to talk to you. I can't save you. No one here can save you, but I can point you to the one who can save you. And perhaps you've already done that. And you're here today 
and you've come under the understanding and realization that you own nothing in this world apart from Jesus Christ. And all the blessings that he has given you, all the blessings that he has entrusted to you, you failed him with. Maybe you need to come and repent for that during this time. Whatever it is that God is saying and doing in your life, in your spirit, the altar is open. Come to him with whatever is on your heart.